Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Donald Trump's presidency is now in its third week, and the battle to push through his agenda is only escalating in its relentless ferocity. Tomorrow, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will weigh whether to continue blocking the president's executive order on immigration. We'll discuss that order with Piers Morgan in just a minute. But first, with each passing day, the war between the press and the president grows more intense. Today, the president tweeted this, The failing New York Times writes total fiction concerning me. They have gotten it wrong for two years and now are making up stories and sources. And this morning he tweeted this, any negative polls are fake news, just like the CNN, ABC, NBC polls in the election. Sorry, people want border security and extreme vetting. Well, one media outlet with a particularly antagonistic relationship toward the president is CNN, the cable news network, which labeled Trump, fake, which Trump rather, labeled fake news more than once. Piers Morgan is editor-at-large with DailyMail.com. He's the former face of CNN. And by the way, he won Celebrity Apprentice back when a certain future president was its host. He joins us now. From LA, Piers Morgan. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Bless so, you. Uh, that just shows what good judgment he has, right? Yes, and I always forget that. But that what a, what a cool thing to have on your CV. So I um, <laughs> remember well when you were the face of CNN. I watched your show a lot. I didn't always agree with you, but I always thought you were straightforward. If you thought something, you just kind of put it out there and said it. So um, you left three years ago. Since then, thanks to WikiLeaks, we've learned a lot of detail about CNN colluding with the Democratic Party during this election. Were you shocked by it? Uh, I was a bit, yeah. I mean, I don't know how directly involved CNN were, but I do know that when you look at what happened with Donna Brazil and some of the other characters involved, it stank, frankly. Um, and, you know, it, it brought to light, I think, Donald Trump's main beef with the media, which is that it's a two-way street, this question of respect and honesty. Yeah. And he has felt for quite some time, I think, that a lot of people in the mainstream media, for want of a better phrase, are absolutely determined <clears throat> to bring him down. And I think he's got a point. I think some of them absolutely are. And they were in the tank for Hillary Clinton. Uh, their candidate didn't win. And now they are utterly determined to bring the Trump presidency crashing down. So you have a war between the media and the White House, the like of which I've certainly never seen before. And it's pretty dangerous all around. So I think there's a difference, though, between having a perspective and stating it clearly, as you do, as I try to, and in a, in a subterranean way that's cloaked from public view, coordinating with the political party. So we learned in WikiLeaks the Donna Brazil story, as you know, where she got the debate questions ahead of time. We also found out that the DNC research director um, was consulted by CNN for questions to ask Ted Cruz. Um, a Clinton staffer uh, implied that the politics producer at CNN was, quote, a friend and an ally. And then you have the chief political analyst at CNN emailing John Podesta and saying, quote, you are a TV star. I've been in GOP hell. I mean, it really seems like there is a special connection between CNN, not just all media, but CNN and that party. Did you notice that when you worked there? Well, I, to be honest and to be fair to CNN, you know, I, I spent four years there. I think the vast majority of people that work at CNN, particularly the anchors, do have great integrity, and yeah, I don't I think, think some, they would yeah. want to be party to any of this kind of stuff. But I definitely think there were people lower down the food chain, perhaps, who didn't have such scruples and who were absolutely, I think, determined that Trump wouldn't win. And bear in mind that the, the, the history of this, from the moment that Donald Trump decided to run, you know, he was, for about four or five months, the only gig in town. CNN and all the other networks were racing to give him as much airtime as they could possibly give him. This, of course, fueled the monster. Uh, and then when the moment came when they thought, oh, God, hang on, he might actually win, then rather like Dr. Frankenstein, they thought, we've got to kill him off. But by then, uh, Trump, the nominee, was gone. He was off and racing around America. And he became unstoppable. And I noticed in the last few months of that campaign, it got more and more virulent. You know, papers like the New York Times, frankly, I thought were a complete disgrace. They weren't even pretending to be no. anything but in the tank for Hillary Clinton. And I found that as a journalist pretty obscene to watch, actually. So for the New York Times and others now to be saying, oh, poor us, you know, we're the innocent parties here. Donald Trump is you know, annihilating the media and breaking down the, the First Amendment and so on. It's pretty rich, I think, given the way that they themselves conducted themselves as the supposed paper of record. So I think that there is fault on both sides here. 
I think that it is dangerous and toxic, and I think that the media have got to start showing President Trump a bit more respect, and he in turn and his White House operation have got to show the media a bit more respect, and they've all got to move on. Well, it's certainly within bounds, I think, for news organizations to call out politicians on statements that are false, and I think Trump has made a few, and I don't have any problem with reporters saying, whoa, wait a second, prove what you say. But it's the orientation that shocks me. It does seem like a lot of journalists see their role not as to report the news, but as to affect the outcome of an election. Has that changed in the decades you've been in the business? Yeah, but I mean, look, I mean, you know, in Britain, for example, we have a very free press, and you have papers which are very obviously partisan to political parties, be on the left and the right. And there's, it's pretty balanced down the middle. There are as many left-wing papers in Britain as there are right-wing. Um, in America, what I don't like is this pretense from papers like the New York Times that somehow they are completely beyond any reproach when it comes to their coverage, that they are completely neutral. They're not neutral. I remember in the middle of the campaign picking up the New York Times and reading it from cover to cover. There were 11 different stories and letters and comment op-ed pieces about Donald Trump in that one edition of the New York Times. Every single one of them was hostile to Trump, including four out of four letters. Now, come on. That, that is not a coincidence. <laughs> uh, and I think, I think what you're seeing, you're seeing generally here what we're seeing in Britain with the post-Brexit, you know, Britain leaving Europe. Right. Now, look, I did not vote Brexit. I voted to stay in Europe. I thought it was a mistake. But I've always been of a firm belief, you have a free democratic election in a free democracy, be it the Europe referendum in Britain or be it the US election here. And if somebody wins, they win. You have to accept they have won. You have to stop the squealing, the wailing, the teeth gnashing. And what we're seeing in Britain, just as we're seeing in America, is just one of the great hissy fits of modern political times. And everyone's just got to stop wailing and actually start coming together, as we saw a little bit actually at the Super Bowl, and start putting America before their own self-interest. Well, I mean, and by America, you mean the basic precept of the country, which is democracy, and the people administering the democracy, at least here and perhaps in Great Britain, they don't really believe in democracy, do they? I mean, the idea that the well, outcome I mean, is legitimate as long as the majority supports it. Right. I mean, that is the essence of democracy. And I would be more left than right, as I'm sure many of your viewers uh, would have gleaned from my time at CNN. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm not absolutely not a, a, a traditional conservative. Um, but I, I am appalled by the behavior of so many liberals right now. I just think it's so alien to the concept of being a liberal. They, they bang on about you know, democracy. They bang on about tolerance, about fairness. And yet they're behaving exactly the same way that they warned us all that Donald Trump and his supporters right would behave if and when, as they assumed, he lost. And I just don't think you can do that. I also think, knowing Trump as I've done for 10 years very well, it's completely the wrong way to go about trying to defeat him. If I was on the left, I would surely by now be trying to work out how have we lost to somebody like Donald Trump, who's a non-politician, he wasn't even a guy with any military experience. He's come out of nowhere as a business guy and a TV star, and he's become the president of the United States. How has that happened? And the reality is that for all the fancy talk about Barack Obama being this wonderful president, actually, in the polls before the election, over 70% of Americans said they were unhappy with the direction of the That's right. country. And Hillary Clinton was a terrible candidate who offered nothing new, nothing fresh. And I was doing a documentary series around Florida and Texas throughout last year. I spent a lot of time in those states, and I could feel the Trump phenomenon as it was happening in real time. And it really came down to this. They thought that Donald Trump cared about the stuff they actually cared about. And that's how he managed to resonate. And he won, and he won fair and square. So my message to the left is, if you want to try and beat Donald Trump, and do it democratically and stop trying to delegitimize him. Stop trying to make every tweet, every statement, every comment he says the Armageddon of the world and just try and apply some rational political common sense to defeating your opponent. We, we, we seek that every night on this show. So I, I think <laughs> a lot of Americans look to Europe and the UK and they say it's changed an awful lot in the past 40 years. I know this is a regular visitor to your country and others. And it hasn't gotten better, and part of the reason it hasn't gotten better is because of the immigration policies in Europe. Those countries are more divided, they're more dangerous, they're less happy, and they're poorer. 
How do we, I know you're against the president's executive orders on immigration, but how do we prevent what's happened in the UK and Sweden and Germany and France from happening here? Well, let me first of all say that I absolutely agree with Donald Trump that the threat from Islamic terrorism is very real and very dangerous. And he's quite right to cite what has happened in Paris twice, in Nice, in Brussels, as examples of where the massive amount of migration through Europe has created a lot of turmoil, a lot of unease, a lot of insecurity amongst the people. Yeah. Because no one's really quite sure who all these people are, where they're coming from, what their motivation is. So Donald Trump is absolutely right, I believe, to want to protect America as his number one mission statement right now. And he's absolutely right to say that Islamic State presents a real and very dangerous threat to America. And he's absolutely right, thirdly, to look at what's happened in Europe and say, how do we avoid what has happened there, particularly in, say, Germany, with a million people being led into the country and then all hell breaking loose? How do we stop that coming to America? Where I disagree with him is just in the implementation of this ban, where it seemed to me perverse to not include countries like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan right. and Egypt and others, which foment so That's much terrorism. Point. Also, I didn't, I didn't like the idea of people with green cards being detained and threatened with deportation. Well, I didn't like the and idea. They, and then they of, went of, back on that pretty right. quick. But, but so in just one right. so, time, so there were the things, there were things that were wrong about it. But the, well, the, this is the key point. I mean, for all those screaming at Donald Trump, you know, I say to them, well, okay, what's your idea? You know, and the, the main idea from the left appears to be we've all got to talk more to the community. Well, that's all fine. That's all fine. But while you're talking, ISIS are right now planning attacks right. on the British mainland, on the American exactly. mainland, and they've got to somehow be stopped. So I, I think Donald Trump is right in his concern, and he's just, I think, probably slightly wrong in the way he's executed this. But let's not Sounds all fair. get so pious that we put the attack <laughs> right. on Donald Trump and our hatred of him before the real threat, which is people trying to kill and maim and behead us. That's a bracing reminder. Piers Morgan, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks. Pleasure.